Do you suffer from migraines? Do you have dry eye syndrome? Or do you, like me, struggle to see the golf ball in the fairway after you've hit it? (laughs) If any of those are questions you say yes to, you're going to love this episode. One of the reasons I brought today's guest on to talk about eye health is not so long ago, I was at the eye doctor wondering about something that was happening to my eyes and what I learned from the eye exam I had that put my greater fears to rest was that basically the surface of my eyes are like sandpaper because most likely of so many hours running and riding bicycles, even though generally riding bikes, I would have sunglasses on against the wind and the sun and the elements. So when you're outside, when you're being active, especially this summer, when we record live, but listen, we all know that if you're in a Northern climate and there's snow, the glare from that doesn't make it any easier on the eyes. So now is the time to really think about our eye health, because if you, like me, are squinting, you're dealing with crow's feet in part because you don't see quite as well as you did, whether it's up close or long distance. You're going to love today's episode. Let's dive in. But first, I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset, often about what to eat and how to move so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in the second and better half. Let's get started. My guest today is Dr. Ronnie Bannock, and she's America's integrative eye doctor. She is board certified ophthalmologist and fellowship trained neuro ophthalmologist with additional training in functional medicine. Dr. Rani focuses on the root causes of eye diseases and uses integrative strategies for conditions such as thyroid eye disease, macular degeneration, cataract, dry eye, glaucoma, and other autoimmune diseases of the visual system. Her treatments are based on nutrition, botanicals, lifestyle modification, essential oils, and supplements. Dr. Rani runs a private practice based in New York City and is also Associate Professor of Mount Sinai in New York City, where she serves as an educator and researcher. As Principal Investigator of several clinical trials in diseases of the optic nerve, Dr. Rani uses cutting-edge approaches such as nanotechnology and gene therapy, and she's going to have to tell me what those are. Dr. Rani is frequently featured as an expert in the media and has been interviewed on Good Morning America, CBS, NBC, ABC, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and Fox, amongst many others. Dr. Rani has been voted as Castle Connolly Top Doctor and New York Magazine's Best Doctor in Ophthalmology every year since 2017, and we are oh so honored to have her here. Dr. Rani, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you very much for having me on. And I'm so excited because as I was just telling you, I just turned 50 myself and I'm so excited to learn from you as well. Well, you know, you have to be like a qualified card carrying flipping 50 person to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're okay. You're legal to drive. All right. And Excellent. this is such a great topic. There is so much, I mean, this is such an esteemed uh, guest to have. I'm so happy to have you here, but this is just a topic that's near and dear to all of our hearts because, you know, when you start to lose sight or it's not as good as it was, and then you, you deal with, I'm dealing with a pet right now, you know, who's losing his sight. And that just makes me so much more conscious of my own. But in dealing with parents, I think we're all so very curious about how do we care for our eyes? How can we keep them? And, you know, we hear rumors that there are hopes or ways that we might be able to improve them. So hopefully we'll get to all of that. But before we do, tell us your story. Why eyes? Why not feet? Hands? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, eyes are fascinating. Um, I was introduced to the world of ophthalmology back when I was in college. I went and watched some eye surgeries and I was hooked. And, you know, what, what I realized is that so many of us take our eyesight for granted. You know, we just assume that we'll be able to see. And it's not until we can't or we have an issue with our vision that we realize how precious it really is. So I've really made it, you know, my mission in my career to help people retain their eyesight or recover their eyesight if they've lost it. And it's just so rewarding to be able to help people with their vision and, and sometimes restore the gift of sight. So it's, it's I love my profession. Um, and then there's another side of it, which is uh, raising awareness about eye health, because again, it kind of gets... Uh, put on the back burner for many people. You know, we think about our gut health, we think about our brain health, our skin, et cetera, but we don't really think about our eyes that much. So I just wanted to, you know, raise awareness amongst general the general public as well as my colleagues, because a lot of my colleagues also, um, they're wonderful physicians, they're very well educated, but they may not necessarily dive so deeply into the preventative aspects of, of eye health, which is really, really important. As, as you mentioned, as we get older, many of us start to have some issues with our vision, but many of those issues are preventable and um, it can be done through nutrition and lifestyle. So that's, that's my mission in life to help promote that. So as a fitness professional, you know, I often will tell everybody, you know, the ideal time to start doing that strength training is when you're 20 or 30. But if you haven't done that, it's not too late. We can still see improvements. Is the same true of eyes? Absolutely. And I would actually venture to say that it's best to start when you're a kid. <laughs> so, you know, parents <laughs> who are any parents who are listening, try to instill healthy eye habits in your children that will help for the rest of their lives. But yes, absolutely. Even if you didn't, you know, perhaps do some of these things when you were younger in your 20s and 30s and 40s, any time is a great time to start. So, um, even for example, myself, um, I'll just tell you my personal story. Um, I grew up on a very unhealthy diet. Uh, my parents thought it was great to have Twinkies and soda and ice cream and pizza. And that's what I grew up eating. And that's what I ate into most of my adult life until I realized that it was going to be, it was getting to be detrimental to my health. And, um, and once I changed my diet and also changed some of my unhealthy lifestyle choices, I really started to turn around in terms of some of my, my own issues. So, um, again, that was well into my forties that, that, that I had that realization. And, um, I just want to emphasize it's never too late to start. <laughs> so while you say never too late to start that, supposes a couple of things. So are we then starting now preventing worsening or is it possible to reverse some damage we might be experiencing? It all depends on what it is. So there are so many different eye conditions that affect people as they get older. Um, the most common ones being things like cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration. Now, the goal, the, my goal for for you know my treatment protocols is to prevent all of that. But even if you've been diagnosed with it, let's say you've been diagnosed with an early stage of any of those conditions, you can certainly pause, you know, put the put the progression on pause and prevent further damage and retain the vision that you have. That's really the key here is to. Uh, preserve what you have if you can't necessarily reverse it. But there are other conditions. For example, dry eye is a very common condition, particularly amongst women, particularly amongst women who are perimenopausal, postmenopausal. Um, it's almost ubiquitous in most of my patients above, female patients above the age of 50. Um, and so you know, something like that is reversible. It is treatable and it is possible to get past it and really keep it at bay. So it just all depends on what the eye condition is. Okay. So let me give you an example. Not that you're here or can you treat me because we didn't have a doctor patient relationship, but hypothetically, if somebody could not see the golf ball after they hit it, can that be improved? <laughs> Yes. Well, it depends on, first of all, why. For example, is it a glasses issue? Is it that um, you have something called a refractive error, which can basically be corrected optically, either with glasses or with contacts or perhaps even surgery like LASIK? It is correctable. It is treatable. Um, now, if it's something else, for example, cataracts um, develop 
in, in many people as they get older, usually once they're into their 60s and 70s, cataracts begin to develop. And that can also degrade vision, particularly vision for distance. Uh, people have trouble hitting a golf ball. They may have trouble driving. They may even have trouble with near tasks like reading. Reading may become very difficult or perhaps even cooking, you know, preparing food. Um, that may become challenging from cataracts. So uh, something like that is very treatable, very reversible. Um, the prevention part is based in nutrition, but the actual, you know, if it progresses to a certain point and it's really impairing vision, the treatment is surgery. So it's really a mix of both things. You know, there's part of it is prevention and part of it is the traditional medical and possibly surgical approaches to eye health. Great answer. Okay, so you alluded to, you know, Good eye health is very much about nutrition, and one of the first things on the list included in what you use for treatment. So give us some suggestions. What, what are ways we can eat for eyes? Yeah, my favorite question. <laughs> I love this question. Um, so a lot of people come to me and say, well, Dr. Rani, you know, if I just eat a bunch of carrots, isn't that enough for my yeah, eyes? Right. And <laughs> it is. That's what we've been told. And and what I'll tell you, it's not a myth. Carrots are important for eye health. They provide us with a form of vitamin A called beta carotene, and it helps to protect against night blindness. It helps with dry eye. But carrots are the tip of the iceberg when it comes to nutrition for eye health. The truth is that we need a wide diverse variety of different nutrients, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory nutrients, all the vitamins, all the minerals. We need over 20 different nutrients to help protect our eyes. And the best way to do that is not just carrots, but you need to have diversity in your diet and mainly plants. So, um, the pigments that are found in many types of plants, particularly colorful fruits and vegetables, help provide a lot of those important nutrients we need. They provide, for example, there are specific eye health nutrients called the macular carotenoids. Now, you may or may not have heard of these. Um, they have specific names called lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin. And I know it sounds like a mouthful. It's hard to pronounce, but these are eye nutrients that are found in certain foods like leafy green vegetables, like spinach and kale and collard greens. You can also get them from certain orange and yellow colored fruits and vegetables and some even um, animal products, for example, eggs. The egg yolk, um, the color of egg yolk is due to lutein and zeaxanthin. So these pigments are important because they get deposited in the eye and they protect against um, oxidative damage, oxidative stress, um, as well as blue light and UV light. So they're basically like our internal natural blue blockers and sunglasses. So we need to have these pigments from our diet. And again, you can get them from a variety of plants and again, some animal products. Um, also, we need omegas. We need healthy omegas like omega-3s. And, you know, it's a really interesting uh, tidbit or tid a fact that the highest concentration of an omega-3 called DHA is actually in the eye. It's found in the retina. And so we need a good... Um, good source of those omega-3s, for example, fish, fatty fish like salmon, even mackerel, um, trout, certain species of trout are wonderful for eye health, or even plant-based sources of omegas like chia seeds, flax seeds, um, hemp seeds. These are all great sources. And then we need the whole range of B L vitamins, antioxidants, vitamins A, C, and E. We need the B vitamins. We need minerals like magnesium, selenium. I could go on and on and on. But again, the best way to get these foods is through your diet. Uh, get these nutrients is through your diet. And I usually recommend a rainbow of colors. So if you have that rainbow of colors in your diet throughout the week, you will automatically get all of those nutrients your eyes need. And you don't necessarily have to think about it. You'll automatically just be able to supply your eyes with those nutrients. Love it. Love it. So hopefully you're preaching to the choir, hoping they're already doing a lot of those things. And the one thing that I read in your bio was essential oils. So talk to me about that. How is that related to eye health? Yeah. So, um, so many people have probably heard of the gut microbiome. There's actually an ocular microbiome and it's basically a, a, a collection of organisms, the bacteria mainly on the surface of the eye. And it, in order to keep that healthy and, and we need to keep our ocular microbiome healthy. So we avoid things like dry eye and something called blepharitis, which causes inflammation of the eyelids. Um, we need to keep our ocular microbiome healthy to avoid styes and other things and, and, um, 
other issues, inflammations of the eyelid, even allergies, eye allergies. So the best way to keep your ocular microbiome healthy is through essential oils. And uh, in particular, tea tree oil is a wonderful essential oil to use. Um, you can, it's really important. You need to dilute it though. You can dilute it to about a 5% solution and you can just gently put it on a little cotton swab and clean your eyelids off with that. You can even put it in a diffuser. Now, this is something I love is, you know, at nighttime, you can keep a little diffuser by your bedstand and have that aromatherapy working for you throughout the night to help protect your eyes and your eyelids. So that's just one example of how you can use essential oils. Um, other ways you can use essential oils for eye health, well, this is slightly indirectly, but for migraine, um, I love essential oils for migraine. And many people have migraine with visual symptoms, so that can help with that as well. But um, I love peppermint, lavender, and frankincense for, um, for migraine prevention. Um, and again, you can do that either topically to the skin, um, you can inhale it, uh, you can even do it as a tincture or capsule, and that can be, that can be quite helpful as well. Let's let's dive in a little bit to migraines. I mean, that is a topic that we actually haven't hit on very much, if at all. And yet our audience during menopause are much more prone to having it, even if they've never had it or having it more frequently or more intensely, if they do have a history of it. How is that tied to eyes and what can we do? possibly if there is something to prevent migraines from going on, if it's related to eyes? Yeah, great question. And again, one of my favorites, because I'm actually a migraine sufferer myself, and I've been through a lot of these these uh, these issues that many, many patients have been through, and particularly women have been through. So migraine is not just a headache. You know, a lot of people think of it as a headache, but it's well beyond a headache. It's really a neurologic syndrome. And there are changes that happen in the brain that cause migraine. There are changes in blood vessels. Blood vessels constrict, they dilate. Um, and those changes can cause a lot of the symptoms of migraine beyond the headache. So uh, it can cause light sensitivity. Many people can get flashing lights from migraine. Um, they can even get loss of vision or even double vision. So it can be really quite frightening if you have some of these visual symptoms associated with migraine. There's a particular type of sim symptom called visual aura where um, people actually see flashing lights before the migraine starts or before the headache starts. So many ocular visual symptoms and unfortunately, many people think they're having a stroke when they start having these symptoms. So it's important to realize that um, these symptoms do exist. They're very common. But if you're getting them for the first time, particularly if you've never had them before in childhood or in young adulthood, and now all of a sudden you're getting them as you're you know, in your 50s or 60s, definitely get it checked out, first of all. See your, either your eye doctor, see a neurologist, make sure it's not something more serious I like to say, just, just get, get, get a baseline exam, be tested. And as long as it's nothing, you know, nothing shows up on the baseline exam, it's probably migraine related. And there are amazing ways to treat it naturally. Um, you know, of course, yes, there are medications that can be used for migraine and yes, sometimes medications are necessary, but my goal is with, especially with my patient protocols is to teach people how to, how to deal with migraine from a nutritional aspect as well as a lifestyle aspect and supplements as well. So these interventions can be so effective in helping to improve headaches, uh, particularly uh, around menopause, because what happens is that during menopause, obviously our hormone levels are changing and particularly estrogen and progesterone drop. And when those two hormones drop, people are more susceptible to migraine. So that's why sometimes there's a sharp rise in migraine frequency during menopause. But then afterwards, once menopause is, is um, uh, passed, I should say, um, not improved necessarily, but passed, people tend to have improvement in their migraines because their hormones um, kind of stabilize and they're not as susceptible to those changing levels. So uh, managing the hormones through, through specific foods is very important. Um, I like to use phytoestrogens, for example, and uh, it can really, really prove very beneficial. Fantastic. Good news for some of our listeners. This is in bringing to light the migraines and the light sensitivity during this time of year where we're recording, although I think in winter, especially if you're in a northern climate, sun against snow makes it just equally as bright, if not more so. What do we need to be conscious of? when we're exposed more hours of the day to bright sunlight 
you know, in terms of what's best, you know, a, a visor, shading the eyes, sunglasses, is the, are there good versus bad sunglasses? What are some good sun sense eye care tips? Yeah, it's a great question, especially as we head into, into the summer months. Um, so, uh, the, the sun's UV rays, UVA and UVB rays are very powerful and they can do a lot of damage to our eyes. If, if we're not protecting our eyes, they can cause uh, problems on the surface of the eye. They can cause growths on the surface of the eye called pterygium or pinguecula. They can cause problems with the cornea. They can cause actually a burn on the cornea. They can lead to cataracts. They can worsen macular degeneration. They can even lead to cancers of the eye or eyelids. So we need to be very, very mindful of UV exposure with our eyes and protect our eyes all the time. And I tell my patients, even on cloudy days, when you think the sun's not so bright, if you're going out midday, definitely either wear a wide brimmed hat, wear a visor or wear the sunglasses. Now um, to, a- to answer your question, what type of sunglasses are best? Well, um, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I, should I be getting these super expensive sunglasses? Well, what I tell people is you can get a pair of $10 sunglasses or you can get a pair of $300 sunglasses. As long as the sunglasses have a little sticker that says 100% UVA, UVV blocking, or the sticker may say UV 400, which basically means it's blocking all rays less than 400 nanometers. Both of those stickers are providing your eyes the protection they need. Um, not the sticker, but obviously what the, what the sticker represents, <laughs> the filter. So, um, so look for that sticker when you're buying sunglasses. So whether you get them at Costco or whether you go to Versace, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Just look for that sticker and you know that your eyes are going to be protected. And like I said before, those nutrients are really important. So you don't just want to wear the sunglasses. You also want to make sure that you're eating the right types of an- uh, foods that will provide you with those antioxidants to protect your eyes. Super important. Great tips. Okay. And you and I were talking about this too in the green room before we went live about um, swimming. And so just even being around a swimming pool, whether listeners are just casually preferring to float on it or, Mm -hmm. you know, risking getting splashed or being in it enough to get chlorine in their eyes and or wearing goggles, which sometimes can be irritating. I know mine will repeatedly leak anyway. So what's the influence of chlorine exposure to that on the eyes and what's the What's the remedy? So post swim, are there things we should be doing? Yeah. So, um, so chlorine, we, we've all probably experienced this if we've gone into a pool or even into salt water, um, that water can really sting. You know, if it gets in your eye, it may cause irritation, burning. If you have dry eyes, it could make your eyes worse. Um, sometimes even allergy type symptoms afterwards, after swimming, like itching, discharge, et cetera. So, um, so yes, swim goggles are a wonderful help. Um, and make sure you have a tight fit. As, as you were mentioning, you want to have a good fit, no leaks. Um, but I'll just mention something else about contact lens wearers. So I myself am a contact lens wearer. But what I'll say is, this is my public service announcement of the day. If you're going into a pool or even into the ocean, make sure that you wear closely fitting contact uh, goggles or daily contacts and then throw those contacts away because there are some nasty bugs that live in pools um, that are basically amoebas. And if those amoebas get into your eye and infect your cornea, it can be devastating. And I've definitely seen patients where they've gotten very serious corneal infections, corneal ulcers from wearing their contacts in swimming pools or even a hot tub, for example. These bugs love to live in hot tubs as well. Um, so just be very mindful of that and um, and just, you know, again, throw out your contacts after going swimming or wear those well-fitting goggles. Great suggestions. Okay, I'm going to go into an area you may never have expected I would. Okay, <laughs> I'm ready for you. <laughs> I'm going to do this for for some of our listeners who may actually be doing this. So I've got good friends who do this regularly. Do you have any concerns? And there's no judgment that I'm giving, by the way, listeners, with this. It's just consciousness for you and, and asking out of curiosity. Do you have any concerns about eyelash extensions or uh, permanent eyeliner tattoos? Ah, I thought you were going to ask a different question. 
Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was getting ready for a different question about sun gazing, which we can talk about. Oh. But um, but eyelash extensions and um, et cetera. So, you know, I, I've seen, um, you know, many of my patients wear uh, eyelash extensions. The issue is with the glue. So that glue can really block the, we have tiny little glands right by our eyelashes that secrete oils that help us with our tear film to help prevent dry eye. So that glue can really plug up the the glands and it can cause uh, gland irritation. It can worsen dry eye and it can also cause styes. I've seen a ton of styes in women who wear eyelash extensions. Now, um, the alternative is to wear uh, what I like, magnetic lashes, which is basically, you know, use an eyeliner that's magnetic and you just clip on the magnets on top. And then you can just clean off that magnetic eyeliner with uh, um, eye makeup remover. Um, and some people prefer to use eyelash serums. And those can be helpful as well to really thicken your lashes. But just a couple of words of caution about the serums. So the serums are actually uh, a type of prostaglandin. And it's an it's a compound made by the body. But um, when it's given to the eyes, particularly the eyelid and the eyelashes, it can cause changes in the eyelid. It can cause not just thickening of the lashes, but it can cause pigment changes. So um, you may notice like a darkening around your eyelids or a hollowed outlook, or um, even some people who have very light colored eyes or hazel colored eyes, um, they can even have a change in eye color with this prostaglandin lash serum. So just be aware of that, that there is a small risk that if you have beautiful blue eyes or hazel eyes or even green eyes, that your eye color may change. It may actually become brownish. So uh, just a little word of caution there about those lash serums. Great tips. Okay, now you're going to have to school me. Sun gazing? Okay. Sun gazing, yes. <laughs> what is that? So, so sun gazing is a, um, it's a routine that some people abide by where they wake up in the early morning uh, when the sun is just rising in the horizon and they stare at the sun. They, uh, with both eyes open, no sun protection whatsoever, they stare at the sun. And the thought is that those those early morning UV rays will stimulate vitamin D protection, stimulate our pineal gland, help us with our circadian rhythm, etc. cetera. Um, what I'll say is that I have seen um, some pretty uh, unfortunate cases of burns in the retina from sun gazing where people are looking at the sun and that those rays are so powerful, even in the early morning, that they can get through the cornea, they can get through the lens, they can get to the retina and cause a burn. And if you get a burn in the retina, unfortunately, it's a scar and it doesn't heal, it doesn't resolve. And so um, now it doesn't happen that often, but what I would say is if you want to do sun gazing for health reasons, you know, for your vitamin D level, for uh, managing your circadian rhythm, if you are going to do it, do it with your eyelids closed and you'll still get the benefits of those early morning rays, but you're not going to get that risk to, uh, to your retina. So just, just do it with a little bit of a a precaution there. Great. Well, thank you for schooling me on that. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I I know it's it's a popular, you know, it was really popular about two, three years ago. I don't know if people still do it, but, um, yeah, it it is a little concerning. (laughs) Interesting. Okay. I've got two questions for sure. And then I'm going to come back to you with a bigger question, but um, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, some things can be corrected and maybe it's a candidate for a Lasix. Who is a candidate for a Lasix? And could you just talk a little bit about the risks? I think at one point, my impression would have been your eyes had to be actually like really bad is that still true? And what's the safety or the risk? Yeah, not, not necessarily. So initially, yes, all the studies were done in people who are very, very nearsighted. They had really high powers. Um, uh, and what we found is that um, it can be done for many, a, a whole range of powers. So from mi- mild to moderate to severe, either myopia or hyperopia. So either nearsightedness or farsightedness. And LASIK can even be done now for astigmatism. Uh, the um, the laser is very advanced, and so it can be programmed to take care of many a whole range of different um, refractive errors, meaning different optical corrections. Um, now, the thing with LASIK is the vast majority of people 
have a wonderful outcome. You know, many people end up seeing 2020, some people even better than 2020 after LASIK, and they're so grateful to have had it done. What I'll say is that um, not everyone is a candidate. So, you know, if you're thinking about getting it done, make sure to see a specialist who does, has been doing LASIK for some time, somebody who has got um, thousands and thousands of procedures under their belt. Okay, so make sure you're going to an experienced surgeon and they can tell you, they can tell you what the outcomes may be. They can tell you what their risks are. Uh, obviously, the most serious risk is the risk of infection and God forbid there be an infection. Um, the eye may be lost completely. It's very, very rare that something like that would happen. But you know, if you were the, the one in 5,000 person who gets that infection, it's 100% to you. So what I tell my patients is if you want to do it, make sure you're informed going into the procedure Choose a doctor who you can really have a good rapport with, whom you trust, who's done a ton of these procedures, who's seen the good and the bad. And, um, and then also just be aware that after LASIK, you may experience very severe dry eye. So if you have dry eye already, maybe LASIK is not the best thing for you. So just, you know, go into that knowing, you know, go into the procedure knowing that. And the last thing I'll say about LASIK is that if you're, um, in your fifties, definitely. If you're in your sixties, ask your doctor if you also have cataracts, because you could have LASIK, and then two or three years later, let's say if your cataract progresses and it becomes worse, and you end up having to need a procedure for cataracts, that basically null and voids the benefits of doing the LASIK. So you might as well wait a couple of years, get your cataract surgery. And during cataract surgery, we put in a lens that helps to correct for vision. So whether you're nearsighted, farsighted, farsighted, even if you have astigmatism, there are lens implants that can be put in to correct for that. And that way you're able to see at distance, perhaps even have a range of distance that you can see clearly at distance or intermediate, like the computer up close, and you don't have to have LASIK. So just have this conversation with your doctor and be... Um, uh, just be informed going in what the pluses and minuses are for you and your eyes. Great tips. Thank you so much. All right. Absolutely. This season, for sure, I mean, there's wind, there's sun, there's all kinds of things. What is your recommendation for the best drops? Ah, great question. <laughs> um, Deborah, you have the best questions. Uh, so, um, <laughs> You know, the other it's day, all about me, sister. <laughs> absolutely, no, definitely, and we, I, I'm sure we all have have gone into the store and seen like a whole array uh, of different drops. I mean, I went into CVS the other day and just just to see for myself what was out there, and there were at least twenty different drops, different brands, different names. You know, some are called. Um, severe dry eye relief. Some are called digital eye strain relief, blue light relief. So how do you choose? Well, what I'll say is that most brands, they may have some slight differences in their ingredients, but most brands are equivalent. So for example, if you're getting Refresh or Sistain or Genteel or Theratiers, those are pretty much all equivalent. Now, if you have more severe dry eye, you may need to get something a little bit thicker. And each of the brands has their own thicker version. For example, there's Refresh Liquid Gel, there's Sistine Gel Drops. If it has a gel in the name, it's going to be a little bit thicker. It'll last in your eye longer. Um, sometimes people even need nighttime ointment if they have very severe dry eye. Um, the one, um, the one a word of caution I'll give you about these drops is that if you're going to choose a generic drop, which in most cases is perfectly fine if you choose the generic, just make sure your generic does not have a specific ingredient called polyvinyl alcohol. So if you see anything in the ingredients that says alcohol, do not buy it. And the reason is because alcohol, polyvinyl alcohol or PVA, is a cheap ingredient. It's used in a lot of the generics out there, but it's actually toxic to the surface of the eye. So you think you're doing your eye good by putting in these drops and lubricating, but you may actually be doing harm. And it's really so unfortunate that these drops are still on the market. They really should be taken off the market, but, um, but just don't buy those polyvinyl alcohol drops. Not good for you. Thank you so much. Okay. There's one brand in particular you didn't mention. Do you mind if I mention it specifically? Absolutely. Luminosity. How do you feel about that? So luminosity um, is basically to get the red out. It helps to make your eyes nice and bright and white. Um, it's fine to use it. What it basically is, is um, it has an ingredient, which is um, 
it constricts your blood vessels, at least topically. So on the surface of the eye, it will constrict your blood vessels. And so it'll make your eyes look nice and white. Um, so if you're having an event that you're going to, if you're going to be taking photographs, absolutely, you can use it. One thing I would say is don't use it too regularly because what happens is your eye gets used to it. And then when you stop using it, you get this rebound redness, your eyes are really bright red and very uncomfortable. So use it sparingly. Um, it's a great, you know, little, uh, you know, little help if, if you're, if you, again, if you have a special event that you're going to, um, and it really, there's no long-term side effect from it. So it's, it's very safe to do, to use. Fantastic. Thanks for that tip. Okay. Now I've got you here. We're not going to let you out (laughs) because you've got (laughs) so much great information that I feel like I absolutely have to ask you this. My listeners all know what it's going to be. Is there a question that I should have asked you? Is there a question? Um, hmm. Honestly, Deborah, I think we covered all. Oh, yes, there is a there is a question. Yes, eye health supplements. So, <laughs> um, just like drops, there are a ton of eye health supplements out on the market. There's probably at least seventy five different brands. And um, each brand has its own formulation. So the question is, if you're going to take an eye health supplement, which one do you take? Now, first of all, I do think everyone should be taking an eye health supplement. And I do myself and my family does, because even though we may be on the best diet that we could hope for, we still may be missing some of those key eye health nutrients, lutein and zeaxanthin. So we need to, I, my, my personal thought is we need to take an eye health supplement to give our eyes that protection with lutein and zeaxanthin. And the third macular carotenoid that I mentioned very briefly before, which is mesozeaxanthin, which is hard to get from foods. So the eye health supplements, again, there are many on the market. There's an ingredient that you should look for on the supplement that will ensure that you're getting those three eye health nutrients. And that ingredient is called Ludamax 2020. So think of lutein to the max and 2020, like 2020 vision is perfect vision. So um, I have no financial interest in this, but um, it's an ingredient that's found in many brands across the market. So just turn it around, look at the label and look for that Ludamax 2020. And you know that you're getting what your eyes really need to protect you. So awesome. Thank you so much for all these golden tips. Where is the best place for listeners to find more Dr. Ronnie? Well, I am uh, on social media. I actually uh, love Instagram. If any of you are on Instagram, uh, please check out my page. I'm at Dr. Ronnie Bannock. Um, I also have two Facebook groups. So if you're interested in learning more about natural ways to protect your vision, I have one group called Envision Health, uh, E-N, Vision Health, and then another group called Eye on Migraine. So if you suffer from migraines and you're looking for natural ways to prevent and and um, and treat migraines, I, I, I have a lot of tips that I share, nutrition, supplements, et cetera. And again, that group is called Eye on Migraine. And then um, I also offer some online courses. So um, things are a little quiet in the summer, but in September, I'm going to start up again with my online courses. Um, one is on macular degeneration. And you can visit my website to get more information on this, or you can call my office and my assistant will be happy to give you information on this and how to register for it. Um, the other um, online course is on migraine, and that one's going to launch in September also. So lots of ways to connect with me, and I look forward to hearing from you if you have any questions. I'd love to answer questions, so please Fantastic. reach out. Fantastic. Yeah, just to confirm, is it Dr. Uh, Dr. Dot Ronnie Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, my website is my full name. So um, it's a little bit long, but it's uh, rudranibanikmd.com. And I can send you the link if you wanted to include that. Um, Got it. With the okay. show. Great. Got that. And everything will be in the show notes, everyone. So listeners, it's your turn. If there's a question that you wish I would have asked, number one, there are going to be some great resources right away at those two Facebook groups. Absolutely. She's got a beautiful Instagram account too. And the courses coming this fall sound right up some of our alleys. So I'm sure I'll see you there. Our show notes today will be at flipping50.com forward slash I spy. What are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today.